Hi, my name is Jason Lusk, Product Marketing Specialist at TA Instruments. I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. If you get disconnected at any time, please use the instructions you received to log back in. You can access various content by clicking the Documents widget at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. This includes a speaker bio and additional file downloads. If you need help at any time, click the question mark widget. Please ask any questions you may have at any time during this presentation by submitting them through the Q&A window. We will answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Our presenter today is Troy Nickel, Product Manager for Electroforce Test Instruments. Troy has been a technical leader for the Electroforce product group for 18 years and has served in various roles including design engineering, engineering manager, business development, and product management. Troy earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Minnesota State University in Mankato. He went on to earn his master's degree, also in mechanical engineering, from the University of Minnesota, where his research involved developing mechanical testing methods for evaluating biomechanical loading in the knee, spine, and implantable medical devices. The title for today's webinar is Introduction to Mechanical Fatigue Testing. Troy? Thanks, Jason. Hello, everybody. Uh, so we're going to talk through fatigue. We're going to talk through strength today. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the notion of strength and why strength is important. We're going to talk about different regimes of failures. We're going to talk through static strength fatigue strength and uh, measuring those things in uh, tests. So we're going to talk about fatigue principles and how to design good tests to get uh, good results in understanding your material in fatigue. I'm going to uh, also include some t fatigue examples and lastly close with uh, some guidance on choosing instruments to use for your fatigue tests. Okay, so TA Instruments, you, uh, you know TA Instruments for thermal analysis products, obviously, also rheology products. So there's, there's a range of products in uh, DSC, TGA, uh, rheology products. Um, one, one product you might recognize is a DMA. So DMA is uh, testing materials, but testing materials in the linear region where you're not really doing permanent damage, um, but you're evaluating materials at uh, lower levels. So today we'll talk a bit more about taking it to another level of force or strength or to actually fail materials. So this is a product line that we recently added to TA Instruments, uh, the Electroforce product line uh, we call the Dynamic Mechanical Testing Instruments. So we're, let's back up and talk a little bit about why understanding strength is important. Uh, so here are some historical examples you recognize. So uh, in 1912, we see the Titanic. Um, so this is an example of an overloaded material uh, structure. So we have the hull of the hull of the vessel impacts an iceberg. That's one single event that clearly overloads the structure. The ship sinks. Um, so that's a static uh, failure or a sort of single loading event. Um, but in the 1800s, uh, it started to recognize as, as bridges became more popular with railroads, started to appreciate that repeated stress or fluctuating stress uh, became critical to understanding why things fail. So there's a couple, you know, tragic instruments, uh, tragic, there's a couple tragic events of bridge failures and those then uh, lead to trying to understand what happened and looking for that source of that problem. So that leads to, uh, uh, in the 19th century, um, Wohler actually identified that fluctuating stresses, as he said it, were actually as dangerous as static stresses. So that leads to trying to help us understand, um, and I'll help you understand today, why fatigue loading is an important uh, paradigm to understand as well as static loading. Another example in uh, airline industry, a little more recent, uh, the, the Comet 1C, there was two airlines that crashed uh, due to um, due to decompression and what, what happened is there's a stress concentration around the windows and the failure to appreciate how cracks initiate and then propagate in structures like this uh, led, to, led to failures. So then, so, so these failures basically challenge all of us to understand how can we understand materials better, how can we evaluate them better, and how to design structures with better understanding. So that's really the, the, the goal and here from a history perspective we can understand the importance. But even today, uh, 
when we see events like uh, we, had, we had a bridge collapse in, in Minneapolis where I live, 35W bridge a few years ago collapsed. Um, so you can see the, the full understanding of bridges even though it's 150 years later. Um, we, we, we still have occurrences of we, we need to really understand materials, we need to understand structures. Um, so that's an example. There are a couple other examples um, as you think about implantable devices and uh, um, man-made devices put inside of a body. So here's a, here's a stent, a stent failure um, in 2013. Was that fatigue loading? Was it, was it static loading? It's hard to say. Um, also a hip stem, you can see hip stem failure in the image on the right. Um, again, did somebody fall and that was a single event or was it a repeated loading event and therefore a fatigue property? Um, an importance, the importance to measure fatigue properties. So even today it's important for us to evaluate materials, understand materials, and that leads to better design so that events and, uh, and harm does not happen. So let's talk about um, these different regimes. We talk about static, sort of in the overloaded case of a, uh, the Titanic, um, but then also the regime of cyclic or fluctuating uh, loading as Wohler mentioned. So in the static case, we can run a test where we take a material and we just pull it to failure. We just pull it once to failure until it breaks. And we get a curve that looks like uh, what you see on the left where we've got a, an elastic region that transitions into a plastic region where the material is deforming in a permanent manner. And then eventually it reaches the maximum uh, strength or stress and then eventually fails. So that's one test we can run to try to understand a material failure. Um, but if we think about uh, Wohler, we think about the bridge incidents, we think about the importance to understand repeated loading or fluctuating loading. Now you can run a, a, a load profile that repeats the stress and you can look at how materials fail there. So now we have a curve I'm gonna introduce here which is the stress versus number of cycles curve. So here we see on the left of the curve, on the, well on the y-axis we have stress. So this is the stress that a material sees under load and when that stress is high, then it fails soon. If the stress is progressively lower, that material will withstand that loading better and it will last longer. So this is a curve that is traditionally uh, plotted out for fatigue uh, evaluations. And we can see here, we, we can look at, we see the ultimate strength, which is the same as the tensile strength on the left curve. Um, uh, it's re reflected there, the yield strength. And then there's this endurance limit, which is the, the point at which this material will last a very, very long time. So we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about these curves. The, the, the main point is, is we want to be able to run tests for these so that we can help understand materials and uh, allow people to design better products uh, knowing the material properties. <clears throat> so the different regimes here, so again, we have this single load. Then we have, when we start to fatigue, we actually split this into two areas. We split it into low cycle fatigue regime and a high cycle fatigue regime. Generally, the, 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 the transition point is around 10,000 cycles. Some people say 100,000 cycles, um, in which it's, it's the material is plastically deforming in the low cycle fatigue, and it's repeatedly plastically deforming, and because of that, it fails sooner. And then in the high cycle fatigue, it's in the elastic region, generally lasts longer. It still will fail, but it's now called high cycle fatigue. So these are the regimes that we'll be talking through today. Okay, so I've got a simple demonstration. Um, you can do this at home. Um, but basically, it's paper clip material, and here we've got a nice big paper clip that you can see. And the point is, if we think about these different amplitudes of loads, we've got this stress, we have the low stress, where if you have a low stress and you pull a material very lightly, it comes back, it's fully elastic. If we did this over and over, it would last a long time, right? As we pull it more, we see that it has plastic deformation. So now it's, now it's moved and it stays, right? So if I go more, it's again plastically deformed. So now if I fatigue this, I'm gonna repeatedly load it and I'm gonna repeatedly load it in that plastic range because I want it to fail relatively quickly. And what we'll see is this material, I'm actually observing that it's getting warm. It's actually getting quite warm. And as it starts to uh, reach its capacity, then it breaks, right? So now we have a failure point. So that was, I don't know, 25 cycles. So we have for this amplitude of stress that I imparted, 
it lasted about 25 cycles. So now we come back to this curve and we see we're in this low cycle fatigue region. I'm plastically deforming it and I had a substantially uh, low number of cycles to failure. As I take this paper clip up, I took another one and I strained it very low or less, then it would last longer. So we don't have time for that today. <clears throat> So we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about tensile uh, testing. This is j just a bit of an introduction and then we'll move back into fatigue. Um, so here's a classic tensile test plot, as we said. And what we're looking for here is, is the yield strength and tensile strength. Those are gonna be important and we'll see, we'll use those later. But while you're running this test, you can understand the slope of the line in this elastic regime is what we call elastic modulus. So that's the stress over strain. And again, stress is, a, stress is a function of the force we apply. And in this case, it's specifically force divided by the area of the material. So in this illustration, it's a tensile bar that you're pulling, you have an effective area, and you calculate the stress. So as you increase that force and therefore increase stress, you get to a point of yield and then it transitions into plastic deformation. It moves through plastic deformation to a maximum point. And if it's a brittle material, it will fail there. If it's a ductile material, you will see it progresses down, uh, reduces the stress, and then eventually breaks. So some of the properties we can pick off here, we can see the equation for elastic modulus. We can calculate the yield strength. Um, the yield strength, just to note that the, the illustration is a little perfect, right? So it's, there's a clear corner, but in fact, there's often not a clear corner. So the lower right indicates a method that's used where you offset the modulus uh, curve by point two percent strain and then where that intersects the stress curve is what you identify as the yield strength so that's point number four in the lower right plot um, so you evaluate the tensile strength again the maximum stress that you see during the test and then lastly uh, you can also get what they call elongation at break um, when it fails so those set us up to help us uh, design tensile fatigue tests in this example um, or other style fatigue tests, but understanding that yield strength and tensile strength is important for us to design fatigue tests. <clears throat> so now we'll transition into fatigue principles and we'll talk about how to design fatigue tests. So we'll talk a little bit of definition here. So ASTM defines fatigue, this is in the um, 1150 uh, definitions document. Uh, so it's progressive permanent structural change. It's due to fluctuating stresses and strains. And again, we, we, we learned that even from the 1800s with wool or identifying this fluctuating, repeat, fluctuating, repeating stress is important. Generally creates a crack or, and or a complete failure after a sufficient number of fluctuations. So that's the number of cycles that we identified. So the basic way to say this is cyclic damage leading to local cracking or fracture. So our goal is to design tests to evaluate materials and how they perform in this area of fatigue. So we talked about tensile test, single load, you're done, you get that information, that's great. Now it's a matter of uh, how do you identify this repeated loading that is as important to understand as we saw before. <clears throat> so as we design fatigue tests, we're, we're looking at experiments. We wanna characterize this cyclic loading or fluctuations that cause this failure. So we think about some objectives. Some objectives are to measure the fatigue strength so this is the strength or the stress at which you can impart that would, you would expect to fail at a given number of cycles. Um, if you flip it the other way, you could also say for a given amount of stress, you want to understand the expected number of cycles that that material would last. And in some cases, you're looking for a fatigue limit, which is a stress level below which, if you will design fatigue, uh, will never occur. Okay, so as we think of those objectives, now we want to design tests. And if we think about the methods for your tests, some of the main areas that you're going to think about and uh, we'll talk through here are cyclic load levels. So you want to identify not just one load level and one stress and identify what happens there. You will likely identify and you want to map out this, what we saw before was a stress strain, um, I'm sorry, stress versus number of cycles plot that shows you what's going to happen at various strains. It helps build your confidence too in your test results if you get uh, data that uh, reinforces itself. So we, we, we want to we look at the starting magnitude. So let's talk about that a little bit. So you, you want a fatigue test. If you choose, let's say it's got an ultimate tensile strength of 100 megapascals. Well, if you say randomly, I'm going to test 
10 megapascals. That's a substantially lower level than the maximum tensile stress. If you do 10, you're going to be waiting a very, 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 very long time for that material to fail. So likely for your first test that you'll run, you'll run an amplitude from a stress perspective close to the yield. So that, you know, is going to fail at some point and hopefully some point that's not too far in the future so you're not waiting months for your material to fail. You get that first data point, then you can pivot off that and you can say, do I want a test that lasts longer or do I want a test that is a data point less number of cycles on that curve? So then if it's less, you would identify higher stress. You would test that next test to higher levels or if you want longer duration, you would reduce the level. So you want to map out you basically take a starting point and then you go from there to decide how to design that, that next test. So very seldom can you set out when you design a test and say, I'm going to run these levels and you will be successful. Most often you start and you want to start high enough so that you get a failure and then you pivot off of that. Okay, so another thing to decide is do you want to run a stress control or constant stress test or constant strain test? So this is coming out of a different way. It's in both cases, you can measure stress, so we can still plot stress versus number of cycles. It's a matter of are you holding strain constant throughout the amplitude of the test, or are you holding stress constant? So we're going to be cyclically loading this material, and as it progresses, which one do you want to hold constant? So you can think about this, think about the application. So if you're talking about a material for a hip stem, we, we saw that example, the, the load that imparts on the, on the hip is likely a, uh, a function of body weight. So that means throughout the life of that, it will always see the same load. So that's an example where you might want a stress control or constant stress test. On the other hand, if you have a material that is thermally expanding and based on the temperature fluctuation that you see outside or in space, you know it's gonna deflect a given amount of, of distance, therefore create a given amount of strain, then you might run a strain controlled test. So those are some examples of how you might choose. Um, the second thing to think about is to choose applicable environments. So environments, so an example would be in your body, you would choose a, maybe a 37 degree Celsius saline uh, test. So you'd have a, a bath at which you'd test. Um, another example, if you're in space, as I said, it might be very cold, it might be very hot. You actually need to have an environment that you can change the variable of temperature and evaluate the fatigue at those different temperatures. Uh, third, we'll talk about test frequency. So test frequency, uh, you want to start with what your device is going to see. So if it's a motor and you've got a shaft fatigue problem and you're trying to evaluate shaft fatigue and it runs at 3,000 RPMs, well, you can run that at 50 hertz and you can do all your tests at 50 hertz because that's what your material actually fails and it will be nicely representative and you'll be fine. If we think about uh, heartbeats as an example where the average heartbeat is 72 beats per minute, 1.2 hertz, so if I want to test fatigue for, let's say, a 10-year lifespan, well, I don't want to design a test that's going to last 10 years. I will be waiting a long time for my results. So now you want to accelerate that test. In some cases, you might need to identify how fast can I accelerate it. There's how fast can the machine run or the instrument run. That's one thing. But is your material uh, dependent on frequency? So a lot of cases, it'll be research and papers, and you can identify um, some precedent set, or maybe you need to design a study that says, I'm going to test at 10, 30, 60 hertz. Um, if you run at 60 hertz, that 400 million cycles you can do in 77 days compared to, obviously, 10 years. So it's advantageous to run fast. You just want to be careful to run fast. Another thing I want to talk about is uh, representative materials. Obviously, you want a material that's that's, that's made the same. It is the same material. So if it's titanium 6-4, you want obviously titanium 6, not pure titanium. You want to run a test on that. Um, the other thing to think about is material finishes, especially in fatigue where the cracks tend to initiate and propagate from free surfaces. The outside surface of that material is important to be uh, similar to the actual final use or final device. So if you have a a ground surface in your final design, you would want a ground surface on your test samples. Uh, if it's electropolish, you would want to electropolish your sample so that that surface finish, the, uh, the sites that that crack might start will be exactly the same as it uh, is in use. So that's, that's what that's about. Um, loading modes and considerations, uh, there's lots of choices here. You can test in tension, you can test in torsion, you can test in bending. Obviously, if your device or final product is used in one of those modes, that's what you want to start with. 
Um, but there are products uh, or, or devices, um, fixtures and geometries like Three Point Bend that, that's a nice fundamental, it's easy to model. Uh, there's good equations in terms of the tensile stress on the surface of the beam, the compression, uh, test, compression stress on the other side of the beam. Um, those, are, those are nice models to use. So in some cases, if it's, there is a bending mode, but it's not exactly three-point bending, you can still use three-point bending to characterize the stress performance and then use that uh, as a design limit. <clears throat> so as always, you want to go towards um, reference of standards if you can. So there's a couple sort of cornerstone standards in fatigue space. So ASTM E466 and 606, and the, there's the ISO equivalence there. So those are your sort of fundamental strain control, stress control, uh, high cycle fatigue, low cycle fatigue uh, parameters, uh, guidance documents, I should say. Um, but there are also related standards. So there's many standards that sort of cast off of those that are either for maybe specific materials or specific uh, geometries that you can reference. So, so when you can, you always want to drive towards using those standards as reference. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the variable loading definitions. So we talked about this, so with this notion of we don't just want to test at one stress, we want to test at more than one stress so we can understand uh, when it's going to fail. Well, that stress, you, could, you, could, uh, um, you can define, obviously you have a maximum stress, so that's simply if you run a sine wave, it's the mean stress plus the amplitude of stress. There's the mean stress, which is obviously the average between the maximum and minimum. You have a stress range, which is the magnitude, and you have then the alternating stress, which is half of that. Um, one thing I'll introduce here is the stress ratio. So the stress ratio you'll see referenced a lot, so it's not particularly intuitive, so we'll just talk about it quick. So this is the minimum stress divided by the maximum stress. So we've got a couple examples. So here's a, here's a fully reversing uh, waveform. So now the maximum stress is, let's say, in tension. So if it's 100 megapascals, and your compression is minus 100 megapascals, so in other words, it's fully reversing, then your ratio, the minimum stress is minus 100, the positive stress is plus 100, and you have a ratio of minus one. So R equals minus one is a fully reversed fatigue test. So you're going through full compression to full tension in equal amounts. Another popular ratio is uh, the 0.1. So 0.1 ratio is tension, tension, or compression, compression. So now in a tensile bar, for example, or a cable, that's a good example, you can't take a cable in compression and that wouldn't be relevant. You would want to do tension and tension. So if you have 100 megapascals as your maximum stress you want to impart, then a classic is to run 10% of that on the minimum side. So that ratio now between minimum and maximum is 0.1. So that's an R ratio of 0.1, that's very common. If you think about taking it to extreme, if you take that amplitude and make it progressively smaller to where it becomes very, very small, or R ratio near one, let's say 0.99, that's essentially a high mean stress with a really, really small amplitude. If you drive that actually to zero amplitude, it becomes the tensile test, okay? So now we start to see you can design tests with different amplitudes and different means, and you can, you can experiment with how your material uh, behaves in those different changing environments. So, I'll just highlight there's a few other terminologies or, or names for some of these things. So main, stra main stress is the same as mean stress. Mid-range stress, same as mean stress. Stress amplitude, generally the same as alternating stress. Uh, then R ratio, you will see, is, is a term for the stress ratio I mentioned. Um, and then an another ratio that's interesting, too, is the amplitude ratio. Sometimes you'll see this. This is the amplitude uh, of the stress divided by the mean. Okay, so you can just calculate this, 1 minus R divided by 1 plus R. So it's, it's a similar type of, uh, of uh, way to look at it in terms of the ratio of the alternating versus the maximum. <clears throat> so here's a note here that the stress, I'm, I'm referencing stress here, but you can also do strain. So if you have a strain controlled test, again, you might, you might measure stress and you might state stress in your results, but how you would define your test could be strain. So all these all these sigmas could say could change to epsilon, and that could be a uh, strain. You would still have a ratio, in this case, a strain ratio. Okay, so <clears throat> we execute that test, and we run a sine wave of a given amplitude, 
And what does the results look like? The results then we plot on an SN curve. So we saw an example of the SN curve before. Here's another, this is a kind of a classic example, which highlights the difference between steel and aluminum. <clears throat> um, I guess most of us understand steel is generally stronger than aluminum. And here we see that the, in fatigue, it also has higher capacity to undergo stress. So on the green line, we see the performance for steel. So a couple things I want to notice here. So uh, you'll see the, the, the dots that are around those lines. So those dots are multiple samples tested at a given stress. Now, if you test a sample even as perfect as you can get it, and machined exactly the same to the same tolerances, tight tolerances, you test it over and over and it will, it, it's, it's never gonna, all those failure points gonna be exactly the same. That number of cycles will generally have some scatter. There's actually some statistical theory um, that, that identifies what that scatter might be. Um, but you'll see each one of those stress levels then are multiple samples tested, and then this line is fit between them. So that's the first thing to observe is there's, there's scatter uh, for, for the same stress um, points. And then the second is obviously aluminum is less than steel. So if you think about this, let's just read this curve right. So for a given amount of stress, then the steel curve is to the right of the aluminum curve. So that means, and to the right, is number of cycles. So higher number of cycles, in this case, one if not two orders of magnitude uh, longer lasting you can think of for the same amount of stress. Okay, so this is a way to compare uh, materials obviously against each other. The other thing we'll notice is that the line on the steel actually uh, is asymptotic and comes to a flat uh, slope, uh, zero slope on the right side. That indicates that there is what's called run out or fatigue threshold or an endurance limit for that material. So that means if you have stress, repeated stress, below that level, then this will theoretically last forever. So that's designed for infinite life, you might say. It's important to note that not all materials behave this way. So ferrous steels, titanium, some polymers behave this way, but a lot of materials don't. They continually progress down. So in the aluminum case, copper is an example, uh, they will progress down. And now we evaluate this this fatigue limit isn't really a run out, it's a, a stress at which you have more samples than you would ever, or more number of cycles than you would ever expect. So a lot of cases you run to 10 to the eight, maybe even 10 to the nine, so one billion cycles. You want the confidence that it's gonna last one billion cycles. And again, think about implantable devices and heartbeats. Heartbeats, 400 million cycles for 10 years of heartbeats. So you'd like to have material confidence that it's well over a billion cycles before these things will fail. So here's another, another SN curve. It's again the same SN curve, it's got a little more detail on it, but a couple other things I want to highlight. So this notion of the Wohler line, so we mentioned Wohler was the, the guy in the, in the 19th century who identified that fluctuating stresses are important to recognize, and he established that, okay, on a log-log scale, there's this slope of decreasing uh, stress as you go to a higher number of cycles. So that, 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 con that can be a constant or a a slope that you can measure for your material. The other thing I want to identify is on the lower left there's this D uh, which is damage and it's the notion of cumulative damage. So here the, the, uh, there's a theory around how to calculate the life of a, a material or a device. So the notion here is if you impart stress, in this case stress A1, for a given amount of cycles you consume a percentage of its life. So in this case, N1 is the expected life at that stress level. So roughly speaking, this is 25%. So if you run that, you have consumed 25% of its life. Now, if you reduce stress to stress level A2 and you run it, you, you also consume some of its life and you can, you can estimate that by the percentage that you use compared to its capacity. So here N2, is the uh, expected life. So this is about, let's say, 40%. So 40% is the, is the amount of accumulated damage. Now we add those together. We have 25%, we have 40%. We've now consumed 65% of the life of that material. So that means there's 30% of it left. So life um, and damage accumulation is popular in the aerospace industry where you can't, 
You can't simply look at the top curve and say, oh, I'm gonna design such a low stress that I'm not gonna worry about it because airplanes would be so heavy they wouldn't fly. So if you need things to be light, now you get into the regime of you really need to understand the material very, very well, and you need to have methods to measure the cumulative damage and replace parts. Um, if it's a jet engine uh, component, you might have to replace it at some point in its life before you reach a significant uh, portion of its uh, fatigue life. <clears throat> so what does that all do for us? So as we said, our goals were to evaluate strength, fatigue strength, fatigue life, fatigue limit. And what we see here in the bottom right is just an example of a design guideline. So here, there are different design guidelines. These, these solid straight lines are essentially the, the guidelines for, in this case, designing uh, welds. So how much stress should you expect a weld to um, bear or that you should design to when designing a component? What's the stress that you should keep it below? So here you can see one through seven, sort of increasing conservatism. So there's various standards, there's various methods, there's various guidance documents. Um, uh, ASTM is an example. Um, ASME has a lot of uh, guidance uh, rules as well. So that's just an example of what, when you have a good confidence in SN curve generation, what you can do on the design side. <clears throat> so one thing I want to reflect on here is an SN curve is is generally for not only a given material, a given environment, but it's, in this case, usually a specific R ratio, okay? So if, if it's a given R ratio, now we have this notion of, well, what happens when the R ratio is different? So if we have a stress that's fully repeating, right, we would expect that would probably fail less fast, I'm sorry, it would fail sooner, so we'd have less number of cycles than something that we do not have as much amplitude um, on top of the same mean, right? So this, this R ratio. So let's think about this a little bit. And um, somebody who did think about it a lot was Goodman. So Goodman identified a uh, theoretical approach or conceptual approach, you might say, um, that, that looks at these different regions of the range of alternating stress compared to mean stress. So as you see on this plot, we see on the right, uh, the y-axis, we have alternating stress. So if we think about that, if we think about that intersect, that is when you fully reverse the stress, you have no mean, right? Because the maximum is equal to the minimum, the mean is zero, and you essentially establish the fatigue limit in a fully reverse case. That's the, the uh, sigma E in this, uh, in this illustration. Now, if you take a line and you connect it to the tensile stress, the ultimate tensile stress, you establish this line that's a guideline of if you are beyond that, Goodman postulated that fatigue is likely, and if you are less than that, you are safe from fatigue. So it's this, it's this border of not just the two extremes of fully reversed or a tensile test, but all these different R ratios that people might have designed into their products, how do you, under, how do you understand them? Um, so it allows you not to have to run many, many, all, uh, an, infinite, an infinite number of tests to map out this line, but to run a few tests on the line and then use the line uh, fit to um, interpolate between them. So that's one model. Uh, many people thought about this since, and there's a few other models. One I'll, uh, so the, the Goodman one is the one highlighted in blue here. And I'll introduce the Soderberg uh, line, which is very, very similar. The difference is it intersects with the yield stress on the x-axis. So the, mi the mean stress, or in this case called mid-range stress, is intersecting with the yield stress. Another line that's, that um, if, you, if you read about it, um, many of the materials actually land on what's called the Gerber line, which is the parabolic shape that intersects with that uh, maximum tensile stress. So these, again, are models that allow you to take a few points of data, uh, different parameters, different alternating stresses, different mean stresses, and you can map out your material behavior. Okay, so that was some of the principles, some of the, the background. Now let's talk about some examples. So here's an example from our colleagues in Esslingen, and it's a composite example. So the purpose of this experiment is to understand the frequency influence, right? So I talked about choosing frequency, and they identified that, okay, in the automotive space, 
there's many different frequencies going on, whether it's in your engine or in your chassis. Um, there's, there's many frequencies that uh, materials see. So let's understand how composite materials, as they're using more and more composites in automotive space, what's their responsiveness to fatigue. So <clears throat> the materials and geometry here, we can see we have a dog bone sample, um, a carbon composite. I'll talk about the, the dog bone sample just quick. So a dog bone sample is shaped this way. Um, you can see the grip has a very large portion of the sample, so that's a you can think of it a high cross-sectional area. And then it necks down to the middle of the dog bone is a low cross-sectional area. When you have low cross-sectional area, if you remember the stress calculation, force divided by area, that means that's the region of high stress. Okay? So that means if the material is, is pretty consistent, then you will likely fail in that center region. So you want to avoid failures in your grips because when you have this compound stress of compression or squeezing of that material, that can bias your understanding of stress. So this is a way to focus in on a region. You will likely fatigue there, uh, have a fatigue failure there, and then you'll have a better understanding of the stress that you actually saw. <clears throat> so we'll talk about the modes of tests. So the mode here, they, they did a strain control test. So constant strain amplitude, sine waves, um, various frequencies, 5, 15, and 40, and change the stress level with the stress ratio being constant. The instrument they used was a TA Electroforce 3330, which is a 3,000 Newton capacity, and they designed the uh, customized fixture that we see on the left that then uh, goes in the test space of the system, and uh, we measure displacement and force in the instrument. <clears throat> okay, so here are the results. So, so here's a SN curve, um, log log scale, so stress amplitude on the left, so in the, in the, in the small uh, rectangle on the right, you'll see that R is equal to 0 0.1. So it means they're holding that constant and they're changing the amplitude um, of, the, uh, of the loaded, of the stress. Okay, so cyclic stress, 5 hertz, 15 hertz, 40 hertz. What we see is, okay, there's a lot of scatter here. So we see these different lines. These are different stresses they run and materials fail at different points. So that's to be expected. And then when you fit these lines, now we start to see that 5 hertz, then 15 hertz, then 40 hertz moves progressively to the right. So what does this mean? This means that if you run a sample or a sample sees 40 hertz worth of uh, dynamic loading, it actually lasts longer than a sample that sees 5 hertz of loading. So in the test design, obviously we see 5 hertz is different than 40 hertz. That can help us understand if it's used in those different types of environments that they will perform differently. So what does this provide? This provides insights to engineers and designers. Um, they have an interesting plot here on uh, failure probability. Again, using some of the statistics against that data, uh, they can calculate the, the probability of failure for a given stress. So now you see in the box it says that the stress is 12 megapascals. So for a 12 megapascal peak stress, we see that the failure probability moves to the right that's again, number of cycles, increasing number of cycles for 40 hertz versus 5 hertz. So here's another example. This is an implantable device uh, area, uh, specifically a stent. So a stent, uh, a stent is a, a man-made structure that, that is deployed inside of a vessel that's designed to hold that vessel open. And as you can imagine, if it's implanted and it's implanted for years, it's going to see cyclic stresses that are gonna compress and, and strain that, mat that material in that stand over and over and over. Every time your heart beats, you will likely have a, a strain event or a fluctuation, as Wohler said. So the goal here is to evaluate, okay, for the material and the geometry, the combination of both, how can we evaluate the stress capacity? So on the material and geometry side, you'll see that we have nickel, titanium, it's a super alloy. And here's what's called classically a diamond shape. So this diamond shape is a similar shape. If you look closely at the stent, you'll see that many stents, or in this case, this design has these corners that we are replicating here in this sample. So these corners, you can see in the FEA plot in the lower left, you can see that that's where the high stress is. Okay? So you want to test with that appropriate geometry I mentioned. So in this case, they're, they're making samples with coupons that have that geometry. Again, they should have the same material, they should have the same surface finish. So the test mode 
here is displacement or strain control and run a 50 hertz uh, waveform because again we don't want to wait too long for these results and varying the strain amplitude and mean. So the instrument used here is an Electroforce 3220, so that has a 225 newton capacity. And what's interesting here is they're not just testing one of these coupons, they're testing four of them in what we would call a multi-specimen fixture. Um, in addition, they actually have a failure detection um, scheme where they basically measure the resistance across the sample, and that helps them detect failures. So as you can imagine, if one of those or both of those fail, then the resistance goes up, and you can identify that later in your data to say you have a device failure. So what does the data look like here? So this, this plot is a little bit different. Let me get your head around this one. So this is strain amplitude on the y-axis, mean strain on the x-axis, okay? Now the open boxes are devices or materials that lasted more than 10 to the 7 cycles, okay? So 10 million cycles. Black means that it failed less than 10 million cycles. Okay, so we can see this line through the middle, which is 0.4% strain amplitude. And you see that there's no samples that broke uh, below that. So that gives us a clue in terms of this endurance limit, right? The endurance limit at least measured at 10 million cycles. You see up above that, you get more and more failures, right? You can see at the very top, you, everything fails at a strain amplitude of uh, 1%. So what's, what's interesting in these results is if you think about strain and mean strain and amplitude, as we think of the Goodman diagrams, you would expect when you had a high mean strain with the same amplitude that you would see more failures. But in fact, we see the opposite. So if you look to the lower right, we would expect to actually see some black dots in the lower right. But instead, we see that line, instead of shifting down, we see it shifting up. So what that leads to is a hypothesis that says, all right, when you have a high mean strain, in this case, it's a super alloy, and as you strain it, it's changing its phase composition. The hypothesis is the martensite that's formed with that high strain actually improves the fatigue life of the material. So this it starts to become very interesting in terms of how can you use that to your advantage when designing uh, devices, in this case, implantable devices. So the better knowledge you have, the better devices you can make, and the safer it is for people who use them. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, this one is interesting. It's on uh, nuclear fuel rods. So the, the purpose here, the, the, the broad purpose of the program is to understand when you transport nuclear fuel rods after they've been used and you're going to transport them to a storage facility, you put them on a train, all right, they see some vibration throughout the life uh, of the transport and, and hey, even if you have, if you have a derailment, you, you should understand what's going to happen. Um, so it leads to uh, un, a need to understand how these rods, even though they're not stressed substantially during the reaction, you need to understand in transport how they're, uh, how they're going to handle fatigue. So um, the specific study here is really a proving of the methodology, proving of the approach and the instrumentation that will eventually be used in a hot cell. So the material here is not a radioactive material. Instead, it's a, it's a surrogate rod, they call it, but they're working on coatings and evaluating coatings. So they're trying to develop tests, trying to develop test methods and say, can I reliably prove out how we're gonna run this test instrument because if you think about this, you put the tense instrument in the hot cell, it is forever radioactive. So A, it's, it's good that the instrument can actually run, so we do some work to prove that it is going to run in a hot cell and be reliable and durable. But secondly, you can't, you can't try again. If you don't get something right, that, that instrument is, now has to be discarded and you need to start over. So they're very thorough in understanding uh, the uh, test methodology. So here, this is, this is what this first objective of this study is. So here they got um, cylindrical rod geometries, fully reverse bend. So here's an example of R equals minus one. So you take this in both directions. And now they're doing moment control, which is really stress. So it's a bending moment, which is the same as stress. And they're running at five hertz. And then they're varying this amplitude of stress. R is constant at minus one, and the amplitude is changing.
So the instrument they're using is also a 3,000 Newton electrophore system. In this case, it's a test bench system because they want fully symmetric loading. So they're coming at it from both sides with actuation, and they developed a fixture to impart this pure bend uh, on their materials. And then they integrated sensors to understand the deflection of the device under test. So what does their data look like? So their data looks like a pretty classic SN curve. Um, in this curve on the, on the left, you see a moment uh, amplitude, which you can think of as stress. And as you would classically expect, if we do a 30 Newton meters test, it fails sooner. In this case, 100 to 1,000 cycles. Uh, lower the stress uh, with 25 Newton meters applied. Now you get something like 1,000 uh, cycles of life and reduce it to 20. Now you're uh, a million or above, even to 10 million uh, cycles to failure. So that's pretty classic. Uh, curve. Um, the, 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 there's a couple data points here on irradiated epoxy, so they're looking at, uh, again, refining the methodology and determining if they epoxy these rods into the fixturing, is that epoxy actually going to hold up if it's uh, irradiated. So uh, the, the result is, hey, the, the, they've got some good results. It looks like this, this uh, ability to measure SN curves um, is, is uh, now established, so now they can start moving into, okay, now let's put it in the hot cell and starting to do uh, the actual final test. <clears throat> oh, here's another plot that uh, I, I thought was interesting. In this ability to measure the deflection uh, of the beam, they can measure the what, what they call flexural rigid rigidity, which is like the stiffness or compliance of the material. So as the, as the material is fatigued and it approaches eventually the failure at about a thousand cycles, you can see the, the material is substantially softer or less uh, rigid. So you can, you can understand if that's, if that's helpful for you to measure, you can, you can put measurement uh, sensors in place to do that. So here's an example that's uh, an interesting one on, uh, I think that everybody can appreciate, is uh, shoes, in this case running shoe foam. And here the purpose of the study is to understand the physical property change from what, what's called mechanical aging in the shoe industry, which is really about repeated loading. So. There's, there is a standard ASTM 1614 that measures the ability to, to, um, to quantify the damping characteristic and the loads that uh, these samples will uh, um, these, these samples will see. But to take that farther into the fatigue space is what they wanted to do here. So what we see for material is the EVA foam, which is a very popular midsole foam in your shoes. That's the main, it's the main foam, it's not the bottom of the shoe, it's not the insole, it's the part that really um, absorbs the energy and provides a cushion in your shoes. Um, the geometry here is a, is a cylinder, 60 millimeters diameter, 13 millimeters of thickness. So the test mode is a stress, it's a force control. Again, this is similar to the hip one I explained, where you've got this load that you will be imparting on your shoe um, over the life of the shoe is really the same. It's a function of your, uh, of your body weight. So in this case, uh, one of the classic references here is this, this heel-toe strike. So you see this plot that is a, actually a 24, 24 hertz uh, impact at the heel strike and then a equivalent four hertz uh, sine wave, half sine wave for the uh, toe off. And this was the area of higher loads. This is what they, they narrowed in on. So they run a four hertz sine wave to at those levels of 1,390 um, newtons of compression. And again, this is because it's a, a cylinder. You can't pull it in tension. So you can't do an R of minus one. You can't do tension and compression. And in fact, what's interesting here is compression. Um, so that's, that's minus three newtons to minus 1,390. The instrument they use is, uh, again, a 3330 electrophore system, 3,000 newton capacity with 100 newton compression plans. <clears throat> okay, so what do their results look like? So it's interesting, we're, we're not really looking for failure in the classic SN sense, right? Because in compression, um, these, these, your shoes never just rupture, they often just um, compress, and what, what happens is they actually lose their ability to absorb energy. So here's a measurement of the hysteresis loop of that material at the beginning of the sh when the shoe is new and then progressively towards the end of the test. And this is a 350 mile uh, equivalent test. So what they measure here now is the reduction of thickness. They measure the loss of energy absorption. And then with a drop tower test, they can measure the load that uh, this, um, this material will impart in an impact test. So 
it, it's basically uh, identifying this, the result of the study was to, to suggest that, hey, maybe this 350 mile guidance um, to replace shoes should really be reevaluated. Or the other thought is, hey, maybe these foams should be improved and it should be changed so that they become more durable. So that's an interesting example of it's, it's fatigue, but it's not fatigue to failure like we had identified previously. <clears throat> okay, so lastly, I'll highlight uh, some guidance, some tips on choosing your instruments. So this could be an instrument, you have a few different instruments in your laboratory, which one do you choose? Or it could be you don't have a, a fatigue system or you don't have the right fatigue system, which one should you choose to purchase? So here are the, the primary considerations. If you think about how we laid out the test and the test methods, obviously defining the force and displacement capacity is really your first, uh, your first consideration. So if you want to test uh, 100 megapascals and based on the size of your sample, that's that's a thousand newtons, then that thousand newton is your sort of your nominal force that you might target. You might say that's your highest force, but you want to give yourself a little overhead. So you wouldn't want to buy a thousand newton system to run a thousand newton test. You might want a 1500 newton system or a 2000 or a 3000 newton system. So generally the rule of thumb is 50 to 200% overhead in that what you expect that maximum fatigue force is. Because again, you're going to guess and you're gonna make your best estimate, but it could be higher, it could be lower. So giving yourself a little headroom is good. Uh, so displacement, displacement's a little different. Um, obviously you, you, you approximate the stiffness of your sample, you can approximate the deflection you would expect, um, and you can make sure it's enough. In most cases in fatigue, your displacements are actually quite low, because if they were high, your materials would be failing all the time, right? So if you, if you go to very high strains, you do, you're in this tensile test regime, but when you're in fatigue, you're in a much lower amplitude. The, the important thing here is what's the displacement capacity at the frequency you want to test. So if you really don't want to run 1.2 hertz to do a cardiovascular device test, but you want to run at 50 or 100 hertz, you really want to understand does the instrument that you're looking at have enough capacity to run the amplitude you need, let's say it's one millimeter, two millimeters, uh, at 50 or 100 hertz. So now you need to understand not just the basic stroke capacity on an instrument catalog, you would look at the performance curve um, for a given system. And again, choosing that frequency range is a part of that. Those are tied together. So uh, in the electroforce load frame line, uh, you'll see we have systems that have a capacity of 20 newtons, 22 newtons, all the way to 15 kilonewtons. So we've designed them so that they handle various needs that, are, that, that you have out there for different size samples, different uh, strengths of samples and we can help you choose which one is appropriate for the specific application that you might have. So other considerations are compatibility of accessories. So we talked about environments, we talked about uh, saline bath requirements, maybe um, physiological testing that way, 37 degrees saline. Um, so that, or hot cold chambers. So again, space, you might have very cold to very hot. Um, so furnaces, chillers, uh, different chambers, and uh, making sure you understand what accessories are available for those instruments. Another area, and we, we saw this in the stent, stent example where we have multiple specimen fixtures. So this is around using a fixture that goes inside of one of these instruments. So in the, in the stent fatigue example, that was a custom made one. Um, at Electroforce, we have a 12 station version where you have 12 samples positioned into the same system you impart the same amplitude of displacement, so they're all tied together, but you measure 12 different uh, load sensors. So those load sensors identify when the material fails. So now you can run, let's say, 0.2% strain or 10 megapascal stress, whatever it is, and you measure that amplitude is the same for all 12 samples. So you essentially get 12 data points on that same stress line on the SN curve. So that allows you to, to be more efficient in terms of time uh, to get this data. Because if you had to run 12 different samples on 12 different instruments, you'd either have to do them in series and you would add all their time together, or you'd have to buy 12 instruments. So lastly are sensors. So I mentioned the, the uh, uh, flexural rigidity test in the uh, nuclear fill rod example. You might have strain gauges that you want to apply on your material. Uh, various sensors just make sure you understand uh, which sensors you'd like and uh, that they're compatible with the instrument that you're looking for. So those are sort of the primary as you think of the test methods. Uh, you need to make sure your equipment that you're looking at is capable of doing all those things.
So additional considerations, so if you, let's say you've got a few different instruments that on paper look pretty good. Um, so now you start thinking about, well, what are other things to consider in your uh, instrument choice? So technology that you use for loading is, a, is an important area to think about, especially in the last really 20 years since uh, when, when Electroforce basically brought in electromagnetics to fatigue testing, we started to introduce this notion of clean, quiet, highly durable uh, driving technology in addition to what was classically screw-driven systems, which aren't particularly dynamic or nor durable, or servo-hydraulic systems, which can be dynamic but aren't particularly durable or they require a lot of maintenance. So here you bring in a lot of really nice attributes that align well with fatigue testing. Um, in, in cardiovascular, for example, when you run a 400 million cycle test, you can't afford to be rebuilding a hydraulic actuator every 100 million cycles. That you'd have to stop your test, interrupt it, you'd have to rebuild it. So in this case, we're taking a different technology approach by using magnets. We're using suspended mag magnets, no friction, and no, no, no maintenance required. Just a, a really nice, simple solution that fits nicely in this fatigue space. So that technology we put into these different instruments. So you saw the family of instruments. So here we have you know, a few different motor designs, motor capacities that are appropriately sized for your specific needs. So again, we help you choose which one uh, is the right fit. Okay, so additional things to think about is, do you wanna do static tests also? Most people have a, a static machine, you know, two column uh, electromechanical system, so you'll be able to get that ultimate stress and uh, yield stress so to help design your fatigue test. If you don't, and you need to do a static test as well, and then in, uh, in our product line, we have an interesting uh, accessory called uh, extended stroke configuration, where we, we still preserve all the attributes on the fatigue side of the electroforce actuators, right? The durable, uh, high performance, high acceleration. But on the other end of the sample, we have a very um, long travel, um, slower actuator. So you really bring in now the best of both worlds. You have all the dynamics preserved from the um, shorter stroke uh, electromagnetic solution and then you have the ability to run long travel. In other cases if you have a long travel electrodynamic system you almost always compromise the ability to run high frequency or high accelerations when you have that long stroke capacity in the actuator. So that's one consideration that you might want to think about. Another is do, do you want to do other types of tests in terms of DMA creep, relaxation, where you, you, you want to do fatigue for part of your study, but you also want to measure maybe energy absorption or the change in energy. So the, the EVA example in the shoe was a good example where you're measuring the dynamic properties of that material at different points of fatigue. So they're having DMA capability in software and the structural uh, capacity of the machine or and the environment is, uh, is important. So that's a helpful sort of upside to some of the instruments uh, that you might find out there. Another one that's interesting is sterile stimulation. So at, uh, at Electroforce, we have, a, we have a bioreactor product line. So in this case, we take some of the elements of that into a standard instrument, and now you can do basically tissue remodeling experiments inside of a dynamic environment. So this is kind of like fatigue in that you might say you have repeated loading, but now the repeated loading is on a a cellular, so a, uh, a biomaterial, tissue engineered material that as you stimulate it, as you load it, instead of actually cracking and breaking and getting less capable or you're, you're uh, accumulating damage, instead this, this load stimulates cellular response, makes the material even stronger and allows you really to understand now what we think about as repeated loading, but it's not really fatigue, it's stimulation and remodeling. So that's a very powerful tool to bring together the dynamic capability in this sterile environment for tissue engineering. So lastly, um, in some cases, it's very attractive to have flexible orientation. So we, we have a, I mentioned this in the, in the nuclear fuel rod example, we have a test bench product line where you can take these actuators that we have and, and configure them into different orientations. So here's a planar biaxial system where if you have a if you have a material that's a planar material and you want to impart stress, you want to look for anisotropy sort of one week, but then the next week you want to test four samples under fatigue next to each other, then you can reconfigure those and run it in that uh, orientation. So there's a lot of capability out there. 
There's a lot of good instruments out there. So hopefully I've given you, uh, given you things to think about in terms of why we do fatigue, what to think about in terms of the background of principles of fatigue, how to design tests, and how to select instruments. So hope you enjoyed the webinar. Hopefully you found it worth your time. Thanks. Thanks, Troy. A recorded version of this webinar will be archived and available online through the TA Instruments website. We will now begin the question and answer segment of this webinar. Please submit your questions through the Q&A window. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes to answer a few questions that have come in. And we'll start with a question from Sudip, who asks, are there any accelerated fatigue testing protocols that might be similar to time temperature superposition? Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, I think in, in general, um, accelerated fatigue testing is indeed most often done, um, unless there's some, some low cycle applications where, um, where the evaluation is in the, in the low cycle fatigue regime and that's all they care about. In many cases, there is a desire to do accelerated. And uh, we talked a little bit about running tests at various frequencies to determine whether your material can withstand them. Um, but it, the reference to time temperature super, superposition in terms of a model that really sort of extrapolates out, um, I think the main notion there is there's, there's the, there's the uh, SN curve, which identifies this run out, this plateau that essentially can be extrapolated out. I think that's, uh, that's maybe the, the most uh, applicable analogy. Uh, to time temper temperature superposition. Um, there is actually some, some uh, theories on thermal mechanical fatigue, which is, uh, which is this coupling of uh, thermal expansion that creates um, stress and, uh, and strain that therefore you can run mechanical tests for thermal mechanical fatigue. Uh, but that's, that's uh, quite a bit different. Okay. So the second question is from Doug, and he has a question about the carbon fiber tests. Uh, the data that you had referenced okay. and asks whether they considered inertial effects and whether they also examined the displacement to ensure uh, that the samples achieved the same strain and therefore stress um, at the various uh, frequencies that were tested. Uh, yeah, that's actually that's a good question, Doug. Um, certainly understanding um, the test methodologies and potential errors is important. Um, I think what, what Doug's highlighting here is is if if when you're running a test and it's a very dynamic test and you got some inertial effects on your load sensor, you'll actually get a, a, a misreading or an error in that load sensor and it's important to um, what we call acceleration compensate uh, that sensor. Um, so, so potentially if, if, uh, if the 40 hertz is different than the 15 hertz is different than 5 hertz, um, I, I think Doug's notion is perhaps there's some, some inertial effects in that data. Um, it's not obvious in there paper that they, they, uh, they evaluated that, but, but in general, um, I, I'll just suggest that um, when you go to evaluate that and you run this test, so let's say at 40 hertz, if you, if you run a 40 hertz load control test and you measure, let's say, one millimeters of, of strain, um, then a good check is what, when, you've, when, you, when you're done with that test, you remove the sample and you leave your fixtures on there and you actually you, you run one millimeter amplitude test on your actuator to confirm that the load distortion or, or error that you actually pick up during that operation is substantially lower, um, i.e. less than 1% of your maximum load. And uh, if that's the case, then you probably have low risk of that inertial effect. If you, if you do have that, um, could be because you're moving the load cell and you could either fix the load cell or you switch into an acceleration compensation mode. Um, so in, in our case, we have a few different options, but uh, it's basically measuring the acceleration that the load cell um, experiences and then backing out the portion that's related to the mass and inertia. Okay. So Anna and Jan uh, ask a similar question, and, and they ask whether it's possible to use a, a DMA test instrument to perform a fatigue test. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on the instrument. Um, our our uh, electropower systems are quite open and quite flexible, so you can you can definitely run DMA or fatigue um, without much really changeover or uh, or worry. 
Um, some of the DMA options, uh, for example, some of the TA instruments um, systems can do some fatigue tests. It's, it's a little bit different structure in, from a software perspective. Um, and it, it might not be quite as set up to run you know, many months worth of, uh, of tests. And certainly, you can't really run multiple samples very easily in a DMA. But, uh, but certainly, some shorter tests, I imagine you could do that. Um, and again, it really depends on what, what uh, knobs there are to turn and, and methods to set up in the software. OK. So uh, next question is from Abu Bakar. And he asks, or he says, it sounds like the fatigue life of a composite is dependent on frequency. Is this dependency also true for stent fatigue? Um, the example that you showed for stent testing was done at 50 hertz. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, in the stenting industry, for bare metal stents, let's start there, um, there's, there's really been a lot of precedent set at uh, establishing that 60 hertz is a safe operating range. This actually comes from uh, old systems, which were uh, basically rotating bending beam systems that, that you just plug them into the wall, and they run at 60 hertz. Um, wall frequency. So there's there's a bunch of data, sort of predicate data, that 60 hertz was an acceptable uh, fatigue um, operating frequency. Therefore, many of the of the stent um, tests today basically run in and kind of bump up to that 60 hertz. And only if you want to really push that envelope, do you do do you run tests to prove that at 30 hertz, let's say, compared to 60, compared to 120 hertz that you're getting very consistent data. That's where the, the tests, as we showed, the, the, the diamond samples, where you basically just focus in on a material, and that material could be stainless, that could be, um, that could be nitinol, uh, algaloy, and these, these parameters might be a little different. You, you, you basically run a study to prove how fast you can run. And if you want to have an accelerated program and you think 120 hertz is going to be fine, you, you at that point would likely have to prove that to the FDA if you're going to use that data for submittal. Um, but if you're 60 or less, uh, generally with uh, predicate history, uh, that's pretty safe. OK. So I think we have time for one uh, final question. And Colin asks, if, if one wants to confirm that a material will survive over 1 billion cycles at a given strain, uh, is there a reliable alternative to performing tests at 50 to 100 hertz or accelerated frequencies for months at a time? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. I think um, I mean it's kind of like the time temperature superposition superposition question. It is it is can you really extrapolate out without having to run really really long tests? Um, I, I I think my general advice is you need to run substantially long tests to build confidence in that extrapolation. And it depends on the material. If the material, like we see with steel, has a pretty clear run out um, uh, stress level or for a uh, high number of cycles, basically that stress level we can run um, a long period of time. And you get that, that slope that goes to zero. And it essentially indicates that at that stress, it will last, quote unquote, forever. Um, so, so that's, that's, I think, if your material demonstrates that, then you have to get to a point in terms of number of cycles that you can reliably prove that. Um, the one thing I'll just highlight is if you think really, really long life, you also might want to consider other effects, environmental effects, UV effects, and things that, okay, even though from a stress perspective it could last forever, if there's UV de degradation in a polymer, for example, um, that's something to keep in mind uh, for infinite light years. Okay, great. Thanks, Troy. Uh, we'd like to thank you for attending the webinar today. If we weren't able to get to your question, uh, feel free to send it to us by email at electroforce at tainstruments.com. We'll try to answer it then. Again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and uh, we hope you'll join us again for our next webinar. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.